Demons have been prominent figures in religions and spiritual circles and cultures the world over for thousands of years. To generalize, people conceptualize of them as malevolent beings. And in contrast to angels or spirit guides, they're thought to negatively influence a person's thoughts and actions, as well as to bring about negative things. Straight out the gate, yes, demons exist, but they're one of the most poorly understood things in this universe, and the story of what and who they are challenges the standard narrative that's told about them. First, let's define what a demon is. A demon is a being that perceives itself to be disconnected from and separate to the greater universe and all other beings in that universe. As such, it could be said that a demon exists at the opposite side of the spectrum from love, in the vibrational range of isolation, fear, and powerlessness. The state of disconnection and the perception of separation from the greater universe, what many people call God or source, causes a couple of key things to happen. First, because it is so profoundly out of alignment with the greater universe, it causes the being to be unable to take in its energy directly from the current of universal energy. This makes it so a demon's existence is dependent on taking energy from other things. Second, it causes this being to behave <laughs> narcissistically, shall we say. Being disconnected from something, you do not personally perceive a negative impact as a result of playing a zero-sum game with that thing. And so, you could say that demons are the masters of the zero-sum game. Some demons are far older than humanity. A great many other demons arise from humanity and are very much attached to humanity and collective human consciousness. And demons definitely have varying degrees of energy and power. A demon comes to exist when a being within a system perceives itself to be powerless relative to what it needs and what it wants. And when it perceives the other elements of that system that it is a part of to be against its needs and wants and therefore its best interests. And so, instead of loved, it feels harmed. Instead of unified, it feels disconnected, and it decides to separate itself further by pushing away and becoming oppositional to what it perceives to be its adversary. Only this time, that adversary is the system of the universe at large and the other beings within that system. From there, unencumbered by the rule of not harming others, it begins to get its needs met in whatever way is most effective. And that way is usually harmful in some way to something. You could come to understand demons through the very simple act of understanding narcissism and codependency within the human race, in fact. If you want to learn more about this, you can watch my videos titled Narcissism, and also The Truth About Narcissism and Codependency. So that you can grasp this concept of demons, I will tell you the origin story of a well-known and very specific demon that originated from humanity. The demon is Baal. Around the time that people started to settle land in early agricultural societies, the ruling classes began to see land ownership as a way to hold on to and increase their power and wealth. So many men wanted to own land, but so many men felt powerless to do so. Ownership was their ultimate desire, but they felt prevented from it by other men. So many men formed and shared thoughts, ideas, and concepts about their desired identities and outcomes regarding land ownership and later the ownership of desired things in general. This focus began to force a materialization of their sustained idea. Those thoughts took on a life of their own. They had created a thought form, a demon. Originally, this demon's name was Saru, a manifestation of the human ego's relationship to ownership. Then an ancient king overthrew an ancient Sumerian emperor, and when this emperor died, his thought form was supercharged with unfinished business in the form of retaining the kingdom, which he believed was rightfully his. Again, unfinished business within the theme of ownership. His desire to reclaim his kingdom made him a perfect match to the demon Saru. Saru and this emperor entered into a contract, whereby Saru would assimilate the thought form of this emperor, becoming even more powerful and materialized in exchange for his participation in the reclaiming of the kingdom. It was soon after this assimilation that his name changed to Baal. Baal's superpower is ownership, and his desire for ownership is never quelled. This thought form was imbued with that perception that emanated from the collective consciousness from which it was born, including things like individual power of personal accumulation, slavery, 
the ability to control the weather so as to have the power to produce the most fruitful crops, supreme fertility, the power to overthrow other powerful men and take what was theirs, adversarial relationship as a method to build wealth and increase one's own property and power, etc., etc. Ball began to form contracts with living people, granting them power to increase their ownership. And what he got in return was to rule through their rulership, to own through their ownership, as well as the right to feed energetically off of any and all resources that belong to them. Baal was behind the building of Sargon of Akkad's empire and so many empires and dynasties after him. He was also behind the breaking of so many empires when men wished to form their own independent kingdoms. In fact, he was behind the breaking up of many an empire that he himself helped to originally build. Baal is a strong enough thought form that he is often behind the building of empires, but I have seen Baal form contracts, even with children looking to rule over their schoolyards, and members of HOAs looking to control what can and can't happen in their neighborhood, and businessmen who are serious about acquiring other businesses. So just one example of a contract with Baal might be as follows. Imagine that someone feels powerless to owning their own home, and then one of their relatives who owns a home is about to die. Ball may attach to this person's energy field and influence this person with the ability to garner the favor of others. Remember that this thought form has only gained more and more power to garner favor from every person who has interacted with him, many of whom possessed this ability as a kind of innate superpower in their life. And with this contract, this person is now much more effective at using the power of gaining favor to persuade the dying relative to leave their house to them rather than to other members of the family. What makes people a match to Ball is their willingness to play a zero-sum game to increase their ownership. And there are a great many ways that a person could increase their sense of ownership that are manipulative and that cause harm. What is important to understand is though human suffering in and of itself can be a motivation for a demon, specifically because human suffering might be a roundabout way of fulfilling a specific need they have, a demon is not looking to cause harm, in fact. They are perfectly fine to get a need met with no harm caused, but they get their reputation from their willingness to cause harm in order to get a need met. It's also important to understand that only some demons are traditionally scary. What I mean by this is one demon, the one that we would call traditionally scary, might be a manifestation of horror. That demon might be the thought form of a person who was horribly abused in a human life and whom identified power with their abuser and with what their abuser was doing to them. This demon might attach itself to the human biofield of a person who is also in an abusive dynamic so as to imbue them with the capacity to use horror to intimidate and frighten other people away, thus ensuring their safety, something they feel powerless to get in a direct way. And in exchange, that demon can experience improvements to its own trauma through a kind of externalized power over the abuser dynamic. But let's look at another demon. Another demon might be a thought form that is the materialization of the desire for support built up in a family line across several generations of women. This demon may be something that lends energy to a mother in this family line. To employ strategies, strategies like victim control dramas or guilt, to keep her daughter powerlessly enmeshed and force her to stay in the role of caretaker, no matter the consequences, to the daughter's mental and emotional health. And this demon will not be experienced as scary. Rather, it will be experienced as toil and as being held back. I find it amusing when people worry about demons and demonic influence. Firstly, because people are crawling with demons in the same way that they are crawling with spirit guides. Most people on Earth have at least one, if not many, demonic contracts. What I mean by a demonic contract is that most people have a specific need that they are getting met through the assistance of a demon. This is usually a subconscious transaction that is taking place. And a transaction that, though it is serving them in some way, is also causing them and or others harm. And second, People don't need to worry about possession or demonic influence any more than they need to worry about feeling powerless to getting their needs met directly, and any more than they need to worry about their own willingness to play zero-sum games. Because it is these things that make them a match to demons, to demonic influence, and to demonic contracts.
If you don't want to be a match to demonic influence or demonic contracts, it is very simple. Don't act like a demon. And use your free will and your power of choice. When people worry about demons, they seem to think that it is possible to be influenced or possessed by one regardless of what you're thinking and doing. And the reality is, it isn't. Demons do not have the power of assertion. People are perfectly capable of playing zero-sum games regardless of the presence of demons or lack thereof. What I'm saying is, whatever it is, the demon didn't make you do it. Demons can't take away free will. And the demon is simply an amplification of a dynamic that is already occurring within you. You don't need to worry about exorcism or banishing a demon. Take your attention off of it. All you need to worry about is changing that dynamic within yourself that is making you a match to that demonic contract in the first place. Of course, it's very hard for people to admit that they're getting something out of demons. For example, the person in our previous example who had a demonic attachment that creates horror does not need to focus on getting rid of their demon. What they need to focus on is resolving their own feelings of powerlessness to the cruelty of others, and this includes coming up with direct strategies for creating safety. If they're able to meet their need for safety in another way, there is no opening for the demonic attachment to occur. When the preconditions for this contract remain, that hook is stronger, believe me, than any banishment or exorcism technique. Besides, if that precondition still exists, even if you are able to somehow get rid of a demon, another one will immediately take its place. And I'm going to give you a tip. Your greatest vulnerability to demons is your most desperate needs and desires. The lesson of demonic entities is to step out of the patterns of determinism that you're stuck in. There's no source of evil. We are the ones that are keeping them manifested and active. Black and white thinking leads you straight to ignorance when it comes to demons. People love to think of demons as bad and evil and wrong and malevolent. But this is such primitive thinking. Demons are not the malevolent spirits that you have been taught that they are. The reason behind what they are doing, however harmful, is always well-intentioned, in fact. Every demon has what we would judge as positive attributes also. In fact, you would be lucky to have them and their medicine in your life. They have immense value. But remember, anything of value may be used for the benefit of self and others or to the detriment of self and others. And to generalize, the value inherent in each demon is being used as some kind of detriment to something. But believe it or not, this can change. It might be interesting for you to know that many demons are assimilating at this time. Many are awakening and are reconnecting to the rest of the universe so as to take their place of alignment and symbiosis within the universal system and directly with certain people. They do not genuinely want to be separate from the universe and the beings and things that make up this universe. Did you hear that? Even certain demons are done with the zero-sum game and done with the pain that they are in being separate. In fact, some of them are appalled by human behavior. And as for those demons who are not choosing to assimilate or who don't even know it is an option, they are not the enemies of source or what you call God. They are not the enemies of expansion. Demons cause an amplification. Some people need things to manifest or to become clearer or to get worse in order for them to awaken or to make a different choice. For example, let's imagine that a man has a demonic attachment that's enabling him to control other people better. As that control amplifies and amplifies, he will experience the contrast inherent in that control. Not only will the positive elements of that control amplify, but so will the negative elements. So perhaps one day a negative amplification is that his wife and his kids leave him. He's now totally alone. That experience might just be the thing that causes him to decide the connection is more important to him than control, and this might lead him to learning about and mastering relationships. And this might change his entire life for the better. To learn more about this, you can watch my video titled The Lesson of Christ and Lucifer, Integrate Your Ego. The most powerful thing you can do with regards to demons is to stop demonizing the demon. Stop giving away your power by blaming things on them. Instead, own them as you. Integrate them as your own shadow. That's exactly what they are. Anything else is scapegoating. And don't forget, there is always gold in the shadow. Instead of blaming the thoughts you have as thoughts being created by them, own them as your thoughts. Instead of blaming your urges on them, own them as your urges. Don't blame your actions on them. Those are your actions. Don't point at them as the reason that you could do what you did to someone. 
Own your own willingness to harm someone, including yourself, for the sake of getting what you want. Demons are the amplification of people's disconnection and therefore narcissism. You don't need to do anything about demons. You need to do something about your own disconnection and your own patterns of narcissism. Contracts with demons originate from the perception of powerlessness. To not be a match to a demonic contract, you need to meet your needs in a straightforward and a symbiotic way. Have a good week. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and consider sharing this video with your friends. You can also click on the bell icon to be notified of the next time that I post a video. I want to thank you personally for the bravery that you have to step into awareness. I'll see you in the next video.